So yeah, I guess you know, first thing we outlasted Google Hangouts, so that's something. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> so to, today's uh, so before we start, the next talk is seven days from now. So that's uh, not two weeks from now. That's seven days from now. Shaka Lopet. And then we have a big gap. And then the uh, talk after that is October 22nd, I believe. October 22nd. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, let me just make sure it's October 22nd. Yes, it's October 22nd by Hao Huang. And then another November 20th by Jason Lee. In case this uh, schedule gets filled up, we'll let you know. And so today's speaker is Mark Salke. And Mark is a graduate student at Stanford. And Mark has been... Uh, doing some wonderful work on convex bodies and on geometry of convex bodies and his interests are in probability and machine learning. And today he is going to tell us about chasing convex bodies. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, hopefully things kind of work. Uh, so, do you want to start presenting your screen? I've... Yeah. So I'm going to share my uh slides here did that work cool um yeah if uh, people can see this uh i think people can see it if not uh please let us know somehow um cool what if i play from current slide does it still share seems good to me yep yeah okay. it does okay and it, you just see one slide at a time correct okay. yes awesome awesome very good okay um Let's, geez. okay, let's get started. Um, uh, I'm gonna tell you about chasing convex bodies. Um, this is based partially on, geez, <laughs> joint work uh, with these uh, four people here, Sebastian Bubek, Buzz Clartag, Yin Tat Lee, and Yuan Zhu Lee um, from Microsoft Research. So what is the problem? In the chasing convex bodies problem, uh, we're going to be given a sequence, uh, k1, k2, dot, 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 of convex sets in d-dimensional space Rd. And we, the algorithm, are going to move into each set right after we receive it. So it's, it's an online problem. We, we see k1, we move our current point to somewhere in k1. Then we see k2, we move our current point to somewhere in k2, and so on. So here's what one step would look like here. You're outside the set, then you get a request set, and then you have to move into that set. Um, what we want to do is minimize our total movement. So we're going to say we start at the origin, just to fix things. And the cost of our algorithm up to time t is the total distance of like the path we move along in the first t time steps. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare to a benchmark, which we'll call opt, which is the optimal solution who gets to see these sets in advance. So if you see all the sets in advance, you just have some kind of deterministic computation problem to find the best path, and opt is going to always take that path. Um, note that you know the best path will not kind it, it will like not be consistent as you add more sets. So it's not like opt is able to solve it online at all. So the point is to see how well we can compare to opt. So we're going to take the viewpoint of competitive analysis. What that means is we're going to try to ensure that there is some constant alpha, depending on the dimension, so that our cost is at most alpha times the cost of opt. And um, if we can achieve this for some finite alpha, then we have a competitive algorithm. Um, hopefully that makes sense so far. Um, here's an example, just to kind of make sure we're on the same page. So we start at this um, x0 point. Um, can you see my mouse? Yes, we can. Cool, awesome, thanks. Uh, we start at x0, and there's this line. And maybe we move to the closest point. That seems reasonable. And opt is going to move straight to the right. And then there's another set, this convex trapezoid. Um, we again move to the closest point, maybe. Opt keeps moving to the right. Now in our last request, um, there's a vertical line. And we see the opt was just kind of moving straight towards the closest point on the vertical line. And 
we, the algorithm moved a bit more, but it wasn't too much more. So the question is, you know, how much more are we going to have to move than opt in general? Okay, awesome. So let me run through a few um, motivations um, and ways in which this problem is kind of connected to other problems. The first one is more mathematical. Um, we call it online Lipschitz selection. Um, the point is that uh, you can make the same problem, and geometers have studied the same problem, where there is no online component. So what does that mean? Uh, we're just going to try to define a selector function, which takes in any convex set um, and outputs a point in that set. And we're going to try to make it Lipschitz, so the point it outputs does not change too much uh, when you change the input convex set a little bit. Um, OK, certainly you could define, you could try to think about this for other classes of sets besides convex sets, but this is something that geometers studied, um, even in infinite dimensions and that kind of thing. Um, the first thing we need to do is we need to put a metric on the sets because we want some sort of Lipschitzness or continuity condition. So, how do we measure when a convex set changes? How do we measure how much it changed? Um, and the Hausdorff metric is the standard way to do this. Um, it has this uh, maybe scary pair of definitions. Um, basically, it's if I have two convex sets, the Hausdorff distance is the maximum distance from a point in one set to the other set. That's the first definition. Um, and you have to go in both directions. Uh, the other definition is the smallest r, so that if you add a ball of radius r around each set, then the, like they contain each other. If you add a ball around one, it contains the other, and vice versa. Um, this is, well, it, it looks kind of like the problem I just said, because the Hausdorff distance is, is like the cost of opt if you just start at a worst case point in one set and the request in the other set. So chasing convex bodies, you can think of as online Lipschitz selection. Um, it, it will also turn out that this, um, the, the, the right solution to this problem gives, leads you to the right solution to the online problem, too. OK, um, the next thing uh, to say is that you can make a functional version of the problem, and it is equivalent to the um, set problem. So that's nice. So how would that look? We're going to receive positive convex cost functions on d-dimensional space, and we're again going to pick our point xt after receiving this teeth request. And now the cost has the same movement cost, but we also have a service cost, f sub t of xt. So this kind of generalizes the body problem, because um, you could think of a body as being the function which is zero, outside, zero inside the body and like infinite or growing really fast away from the body. And that would represent a body as a function. Um, again, the point is to compete with opt, but actually these are equivalent. Um, the reason is that uh, if you have a convex function in d dimensions, then you can take its epigraph, the region above its graph, in d plus 1 dimensions, and that's a convex set. And um, you can kind of make the function cost, which would be like vertical movement, by um, also requesting the zero height hyperplanes. So basically, if you, if you allow for going between dimension d and d plus 1, and you don't care about a factor of 2 or something, then these problems are equivalent. So we don't, you know, there's no loss of generality if you care about functions, if you just look at bodies. OK, um, so another motivation is metrical task systems, which is basically a more general problem that chasing convex bodies is an example of. So here, we have an arbitrary metric space, and we get an arbitrary set of cost functions that could be the requests. And we want to see what kind of competitive ratio we get. Um, so it's the same problem. You have movement cost, and you have service cost. And in our case, the set of allowable, convex or co the set of allowable cost functions is the set of convex functions. So for this problem, if you have no restriction on the cost functions, the competitive ratio is something like log the number of points in the metric space. So, well, we have an infinite number of points, but we could hope that if we require convexity, then that kind of brings down the complexity of the problem. Um, and this is what happens with k-server. Um, 
in a metric space with arbitrary size, if you do k server, you don't depend on the size of the metric space. Um, there's this more general connection to metrical task systems. Where, so the point is convex body chasing is a special case of metrical task systems, and there are other metrical task systems that people have studied. Um, what's a metrical task system? It's the same problem where you're trying to have a finite competitive ratio with these um, function requests, but uh, you could be on an arbitrary metric space and you have an arbitrary collection of cost functions that can be requested. Um, and the question is, how does the competitive ratio depend on both your metric space and the class of cost functions that are allowed? Um, so in general, if you have no restriction on what cost functions you can use, um, you, then the competitive ratio is something like log of the size of the metric space, the number of points in it. So in our case, our metric space has an infinite number of points. And so if we had no restriction on the cost functions at all, then we would get an infinite competitive ratio. But we could hope that if we only look at convex functions, then the competitive ratio becomes finite. And this is what happens for k-server. So there, yeah, th this is something question. that happens. Yeah. It's interesting. Is this, a, is this a classic result, or is this competitive ratio for? For k-server? No, the previous one, competitive ratio is in this log n over versus uh, log. Uh, I think these are kind of recent. Yeah. Um, OK. Uh, OK. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't have references, but I think if you go on like the Wikipedia page for metrical task systems, it will certainly tell you where to find these. Cool. Sounds good. Okay. Um, uh, a third final motivation is online convex optimization. This is more of a machine learning type of story. So, let's say my functions are one Lipschitz. Then, actually, I'm going to claim it doesn't matter so much whether I look at, or it doesn't matter so much if I get to see the function ft before I pick my point xt. So certainly for convex body chasing, it matters a lot. It wouldn't make sense otherwise. But in this case, um, the difference between the total service cost, sum of ft of xt versus sum of ft of xt minus 1, is bounded by the movement cost. Just every movement bounds the one discrepancy in that sum. So what that means is that you can try to compare it to the same problem without any movement cost. Um, and that's what is normally called online convex optimization. But for that problem, people study regret bounds instead of competitive ratios. So the sorts of things one would show is that you can get a square root t regret bound for online convex optimization. The thing there is you're looking at the best fixed input here. So, so here I'm, I'm looking at the service cost of the algorithm minus the total cost of the best fixed input. But if we want to do well, even if kind of the functions are changing a lot, then maybe we want to be able to adapt to that and do well as long as any possible changing sequence of inputs does well. Um, so like you have to regularize opt somehow because otherwise there could just opt could just always go to the minimum and the minimum could change arbitrarily and you wouldn't have any control. So what you can do is you can put a movement cost in, um, which we also saw accounts for this look ahead anyway. So basically um, the, the claim here is that chasing convex bodies is like the natural way to turn online convex optimization into competitive analysis instead of regret. Um, so this problem has also been studied in like robotics control under the name smooth online convex optimization. And this motivation is basically why. OK, so let me discuss some previous work. So Friedman and Lineal in the early 90s posed this problem. They were thinking about kind of a an convex analog of k-server. And they gave a competitive algorithm for chasing convex bodies in two dimensions, which is already not so easy. Um, they also gave some lower bounds. So in Euclidean space, you get a root d lower bound. 
Um, if you're looking for a kind of a worst case lower bound, like a maximum possible lower bound over any d-dimensional norm space, uh, you can get d and L infinity. Both are based on faces of the hypercube. It's um, pretty simple. So the teeth request is going to be I, I fix the first t coordinates of a point in the hypercube to be 1 or minus 1. And then every other coordinate can be anything between negative 1 and 1. So, so my first request, it's I'm just going to fix a1. And then so I kind of have like one side of the hypercube. And then the next request, I go down one dimension. And then I go down another dimension. At the end, I end up with a random vertex of the hypercube. So the point is that uh, online algorithm has to move one every time step, basically. And opt just moves directly to the vertex that you end up at. So in Euclidean space, you're losing a root d factor. In L infinity, you're losing a d factor. Um, this is pretty much the, the lower bound for the problem. OK. Um, so. I guess re related to this convex optimization point of view, um, this problem has kind of been resurfacing lately. So um, in 2016, people showed that you could chase affine subspaces with a finite but um, exponential competitive ratio. So that's hyperplane or, or lower dimensional subspaces. Um, this is Antoniades, Barcelo, Hugent, Proust, Schwerior, Sh and Squizado. Um, another result I'll mention is by Goel and Wiedermann, which showed that you can get a dimension-independent competitive ratio if your functions are strongly convex. So you know, if you're kind of regularizing your problem, then you can get something here. So if, if your alpha is strongly convex, then you'll get a competitive ratio of 1 over alpha. Um, Another thing I want to say now is that for an for online algorithm problem, there's always a question of, are we using randomness or not? This is equivalent to the question of, is our adversary oblivious or adaptive? Can he, can he make future requests based on what you're doing now? Um, actually, in this problem, these are equivalent. So there's only one problem to look at. The reason is that <coughs> if I'm using randomness, I average my paths to create a deterministic path. I can just say, given all the requests I've seen, I can average over my random seed and move there. And that's also a valid um, movement because of convexity. And it's not too hard to show that it lowers the expected movement. So that means we only need to consider deterministic algorithms. And uh, we can assume the adversary is adaptive. And um, it won't change the problem. Like there's nothing randomization could get us. Uh, like in principle, you could think maybe it's easier to design a randomized algorithm because that setting's you know the easier one. But um, I think it doesn't really help. So maybe it's easier to just think you know the problems are equivalent. There's nothing to worry about. Okay. So let me. Before I start talking about results, let me also uh, describe an easier version of the problem, which kind of is, has ended up being really helpful for getting to solutions for the full problem, which is the nested case. In the nested problem, the convex sets are decreasing. So the picture is like here. You kind of keep shrinking down. So, so it's, it's, very, it's a much easier problem. But uh, if, you, if you try to solve it really well, you kind of get things that lead you to the full solution. Um, one reason it's easier is that opt is just the distance from your starting point to the current request set. So uh, an early result for this is that if you just do greedy, if you just keep moving to the closest point, then you get an exponential competitive ratio. Um, this is equivalent to studying the longest possible gradient descent trajectory that stays in a unit ball, which is pretty neat. Um, but you can't do anything like this for the general problem. 
Uh, there's actually a simpler formulation of nested chasing, which I'll kind of uh, stick with. Um, the, the point is, uh, let's say we can, let's say we're going to start with an R ball, R radius ball, and we can make sure the movement is at most C times R uh, for a shrinking sequence of sets. Then by a doubling trick, we can get like a 4C competitive algorithm for the general nested chasing problem. So the point is, you kind of uh, take a sequence of balls that grow by a factor of two in radius, and you only um, you do everything inside the the smallest ball that intersects your current request set at all. So, and then you just reset every time you have to go to a new ball. So the point is, if you're using a radius r ball here, then opt had to move at least r over 2 because you're using a radius r ball. And you're going to move at most c times r. And OK, there's also a little more cost because you have to kind of move back to the center maybe or something like that. Um, but uh, up to this constant factor, it's the same problem. And Sorry, uh, sorry just to be clear, you're saying that you can, for this nested case, you can just consider concentric balls, and this will be the same up to a constant factor? Um, Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Uh, sorry, uh, that's that's not what I'm saying. So let me say it again. So so I'm saying so the 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 problem is just I I have my starting set is a unit ball or some ball, and I'm going to get these convex requests which are shrinking, they are nested, and I want to keep my movement like O of you know uh, R the starting radius. Um, there's no the point is there's no opt here. Opt is kind of implicit. So I see. So yeah. So 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 if I can do that for any ball, then by doing a doubling trick on like how far away my current request is from my starting point, I can get a competitive algorithm. Like there's only one scale that matters at a time. And the previous scales like all add up to less than my current scale anyway, because I'm doing it geometrically. So let me um, start by explaining an, an approach which is not the main focus of today, but um, you know, does, does some things pretty well, um, and is maybe more intuitive. It's, it's more of like a, just what you would tr end up getting if you tried to do the problem by hand. The idea for nested chasing is Let's say we're near the middle of our current set. Then anytime we're forced to move, uh, the convex body is going to shrink a lot, which seems like it means we're making progress. If the body shrinks a lot, then, then you know, there's not that much movement left. So the precise statement we're going to be using is Grunbaum's inequality. What this says is if we're at the center of mass of the body, then every request forcing movement uh, shrinks the volume by a constant factor of uh, 1 minus 1 over e. So the point is, if the volume goes down by a constant factor, then heuristically, maybe every d steps, the diameter goes down by a constant factor. And if the diameter goes down by a constant factor, then we have the same problem, but with a smaller multiple. So then we'd expect O of d total movement because we kind of moved you know, distance one at most the first d steps, and then we have a smaller problem. OK, well, that's not true that small volume means you have small diameter. You can have some sort of pancake or line or something. Um, but you can still make this argument work. And the reason is that you can split your convex set into like long directions and short directions, and only move in the short directions, and kind of just stay fixed on the long directions. Um, so. There's some argument here, but um, you, it, it just kind of works. So what do you get from uh, this kind of thing? Uh, the first paper doing this gave uh, nearly linear, uh, like d log d, for nested chasing in any norm. Uh, then uh, me and the people on the first slide uh, got nearly optimal in any LP space. Uh, we used a weighted center of mass. You you take a Gaussian density and you weight your body 
by that density, and that kind of gets a better trade-off. Um, so, so the exponent you get is root d for lp through l, or sorry, for l1 through l2, and d to the one minus one over p for l2 through l infinity, and that's nearly optimal for nested chasing. Um, we also did a same the same type of argument for non-nested chasing, but the competitive ratio was exponential. Um, so this is a much more involved argument. You're, you kind of break into phases where there were, in each phase, you want opts to not move that much. And the way you're going to enforce this is you're going to kind of look at the region of points where opt could be during this phase, meaning where opt didn't move very much just during this phase. And you're going to make sure you're moving towards it. So, so you kind of, you have some sort of distance to opt that is a potential function. Um, but it gets pretty messy, and you have to do some pretty uh, tricky like induction on dimension, and that gives you an exponential competitive ratio. Uh, and b basically, it just ends up being too crude. Like you, you, you're using very lossy uh, estimates for like how big a convex body is based on how big it is in a bunch of directions. You're not really using the geometry in a nice way. So um, the approach I'm going to talk about today is the Steiner point, which is this almost magical thing in convex geometry. And it gives you some really tight estimates. So what is the Steiner point? Uh, OK, sorry. Let me first say what kind of results it gets, and then let me say what it is. Um, so it was defined in like 1840. and it's some selector. So it, get, it takes in a convex body, and it outputs a point. So for the nested chase, we're actually just going to say, stay at the Steiner point. For the general problem, we're going to do some sort of functional version. So uh, I call it the functional Steiner point. But um, one cool result before all of this is that for this Lipschitz selection problem with no online component that I mentioned at the start, Steiner point gets the exact minimum Lipschitz constant among all selectors for, for Euclidean space. And that Lipschitz constant is order root d. Um, I can say why at the end if people are curious, but it's kind of a different argument than the rest of today. Uh, so in our nested chasing paper, we showed that the Steiner point has competitive ratio d for uh, nested chasing in L2. Um, also, analogously to this exact minimum result, uh, there's a sense in which the Steiner point gets the exact optimum competitive ratio for any D and T, but it's a sense that's slightly different from the original problem. Um, it also gets root D log T competitive ratio with T requests. So, you know, maybe you imagine in most applications where you would try to like reduce something to this problem, t is not exponential in the dimension. t is like polynomial in the dimension. And then this is nearly optimal. But if t is exponential, then you do actually get the d. Um, so that, that, this exact optimality for memoryless is kind of neat, because the, um, the bare hands approach in the previous slide uh, does better for nested chasing by using memory. OK, um, and then now it's extended to the general chasing convex bodies problem. So there are two papers which are concurrent. So the first one is by a group at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Argu, Gupta, Guru Ganesh, and Tang. And they showed if you take the work function, which I'll define later, and you take its level sets, which are convex bodies, because the work function is convex, then you get the same uh, minimum of d and root d log t competitive ratio in Euclidean space. Um, in my paper, we, it's kind of the same result, except it also works in any norm space um, and gets you d. The root d log t is uh, specific to Euclidean space. So um, I'll talk about mostly my paper, and then I'll explain why it's related to the um, other paper as well, because it, it turns out they're actually doing roughly the same thing, but phrased differently. Um, maybe any 
questions people want to ask now? Maybe this is a good time for a question if someone's confused. Okay, I will keep going. So what is the Steiner point? So uh, I'll only give the definitions for Euclidean space. Um, but in general norms, it's kind of the same, but it's more annoying to think about calculus in non-Euclidean spaces. So there's two definitions. It's actually crucial that there's two definitions. So one definition is I have this function fk of v. What is fk? fk is the furthest point in the direction v that's in my set k. So the first definition is I take a random v in the unit ball and I average this extreme point in the direction v. So if my convex body is like a polytope, then this is a corner. It's the corner which is for this in the direction v. Um, yeah, and uh, by the way, I, I have these bars through my integrals. That just means they're like probability integrals. I'm normalizing them. OK, so that's the, that's the primal definition. It's the, the red one. It's the average extreme point in a random direction. The second one is a little um, less intuitive, maybe. So I'm going to define the support function hk, which is the same except I take the arg, I take the max instead of the arg max. So instead of looking at the point in the furthest direction, I actually look at the value of that inner product. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, well, hk is a scalar. But if I multiply it with the input vector theta again, then I get a vector back. And then I can take the average of this guy. So that's also a point in space. And I'm multiplying it by d. It is not obvious that these are the same, but I'll uh, explain why in the next slide. Um, so the, the point of these two definitions is that the first one shows that you're in the set. You're averaging points in the set. All these fk's are in the set. So you're clearly in the set. The second definition is kind of a dual definition. And um, this one is going to show that our movement is small. OK. Uh, OK, actually, I will say a couple things, then I'll explain why they're equal. So first, um, this picture is supposed to explain what's going on with the red primal definition. So the point is, I have this convex set. And I pick a bunch of random vectors with norm at most one. And for each one, there's some corner of the set which uh, maximizes this inner product. And I kind of associate that vector with this corner. And then I average the corners. So that's why I'm getting this SK point here. It's a little further down, because there's a higher probability for the extreme point to be on the bottom part of the trapezoid. Um, yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, the dual definition, uh, it's a little more, it's probably harder to visualize. Let me just say a few things about it. The, this HK is called the support function of the set. Um, it has two properties which are pretty important. One of them is that uh, a set K is contained in K prime if and only if its support function is smaller for every V. So it's kind of clear that if it's contained in k prime, then its support function is smaller. To go in the other direction, you just note that any convex set is an intersection of like all its tangent half spaces. And uh, if we have this inequality on the support function, that means that this containment holds for every one of those half spaces. Um, the second one is that this Hausdorff distance I discussed a bit before is the exact same thing as the L infinity distance on the support functions when I look at v of norm at most 1. Um, so this is because the Hausdorff distance is the same as like the size of a ball I need to add to one set to make it contain the other set. Adding a ball just increases the support function everywhere by that much. And you know, containment is the same as the support function being bigger point-wise. So this kind of comes out of that. OK. So why do the definitions agree? 
So there's got a question. Yeah. What's up? Yes, I had a question about the primal definition. That just to make sure I understand the definition. Yeah, sure. So here you you integration over all vectors of norm at most one, but this would be the same thing, just integrate over all vectors of norm exactly one, right? Uh yeah, yeah. That's right. So right. So so here, um yeah, it doesn't matter. I could take the ball or the sphere and it doesn't matter. Um okay. the uh, so later when I when I talk about how to do this for a convex function instead of a set, it does matter. I see. Okay. I just want to show I understand. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Good question. Uh, anything else? Any questions? Cool. Yeah. So why are these definitions the same? There's two key points. Uh, the main one is that uh, this FK this extreme point is the gradient of HK. Uh, so at kind of a stupid level, you can just say HK of theta is FK of theta times theta. And if I take a gradient, then I you know, get rid of the theta. So I just get FK of theta. So obviously there's another term in there, but um, it ends up being zero for some kind of simple geometric reasons. Uh, the other point is that when I have a sphere, the outward normal at any point on the sphere is exactly that vector itself. So there's this general identity called the Gauss-Green theorem, which is some variation on the divergence theorem you may remember from multivariable calculus. And it says that the integral over region of the gradient is the integral of the boundary of the original function dotted with this unit normal. Uh, so if we just plug that in above with h equals h and gradient of h equals f, then we get this thing. So there's two things to say here. Uh, one thing is there's this factor d. The factor d is there because these integrals are normalized, but like the surface area of a sphere is bigger than the volume by a factor of d. Like, like 4 thirds pi r cubed and 4 pi r squared for a sphere. Um, I also want to say, uh, you know, in, in case you don't remember the divergence theorem, uh, you can just see this integral identity directly because um, if you just look at the integral of h over a region and you like take the gradient with respect to a shift of h, or, sorry, a gradient with respect to the shift of a region, then this um, first expression is kind of what you get if you shift every input. So you look at h of v plus x. And the second one is what you get if you just say, well, you know, how, where is my region actually changing? That's going to be where the integral changes. So that's, that's kind of a hands-on explanation for why they're equal. OK, so this key identity is the magic thing that makes everything work. So let's say what it does. So first, I'm going to explain why the Steiner point is a Lipschitz selector. So by the primal definition, it's a selector. So I just want to say that if two um, convex sets are close, meaning that their support function has a small L infinity distance on the unit ball, then um, the Steiner points are close. So I'm claiming there's this factor of root d. If I just want a factor of d, I I just use the triangle inequality. That's all I have to do. I just, I just say there's this factor d out front, and then they differ by, you know, at most the difference in the integrand, and the difference in the integrand is at most the, you know, L infinity norm. OK, so there, nothing happened here. Let's say I want root d. So I'm going to use some sort of con like lack of concentration of random unit vectors in Euclidean space. What I'm going to say is that the, the distance um, that my Steiner point moves is the maximum distance it moves in any direction. That's kind of the key. I, I'm going to look at any fixed direction and say, how much can it move in that direction? And the most it can move in that direction is less than d, because I'm in my dual definition, I'm pushing in the direction theta. But most thetas are not correlated with this direction u very much. A typical direction theta has like a 
root like one over root d correlation with u, my direction I'm looking at. So because of that, I lose a factor of root d, so I get I get d over root d, which is root d. Um, cool. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. So, so I just said why we get a Lipschitz selector. It's because we use the triangle inequality and we also use some cancellation. So the same sort of argument works for chasing nested bodies. So again, we have this reformulation of the problem that says we have a unit ball at the start and our convex sets decrease. We want to keep the movement bounded by like something depending on D. Um, the point is, uh, as I said before, this nested condition is the same as this support function decreasing like for any input data. By the triangle inequality, uh, we can write down the same thing, but now without any absolute value because we know the sign of the difference in the support functions. And we can say that this telescopes. So that's it. The, the sum telescopes. So you just get d times the kind of original average of the support function, which is 1, because we started with a unit ball. And that means that we have at most d movement for nested convex chasing. Um, we can also get root d log t. Um, the reason is similar to how we got root d before. It's uh, If t is not too big, then we're kind of taking a bunch of pieces of the sphere, each of size like 1 over t, and seeing how correlated they can be. And they can't be that correlated. So if t isn't very big, then we get the same kind of cancellation that gave us the root d before. Um, basically just spherical concentration of measure. OK, um, now let me say something about the general solution. So we're going to use the work function. What is the work function? The work function is uh, kind of a general thing that appears in these metrical task system problems. Uh, so at time t, the work function at x is the minimum cost of any path that services requests uh, up to t and then ends at x. So x doesn't have to be in the current set because you can service the teeth request and then move to x. So it's basically like, if opt, is it x right now? How much did opt pay? Um, so the value of opt is the minimum of the work function at any point. Um, the one reason you would think about the work function is that it kind of encapsulates the entire state of the problem. Because uh, if you want to know the work function at the next time step, you can just compute it from the previous work function and the next request with some sort of, you know, it's basically dynamic programming. So what do we know about the work function in this setting? Well, it's one Lipschitz by definition, uh, because movement is one Lipschitz. Like, there's just nothing there. It's convex because uh, you can average paths. Um, so the same reason that you can assume you have a deterministic algorithm because you can average over randomness, that also tells you the work function is convex because if I have a path going from x and a path going to y, I can average them and that decreases the movement. Um, also, the work function increases in time. And at the start, it's just the absolute value, the norm, because we're starting at 0. OK, so what's the Steiner point of a convex function? Well. Um, we can motivate this by thinking, how would we embed a convex body as a convex function? And the way we would do that is we would make the function which is 0 on the body and then grows away from the body. So maybe it's the distance from the body when you're um, not in the body. That's convex. And um, basically, this support function and this extreme point, so this fk and this hk, you can get those by thinking of like where is the tangent hyperplane to this convex function that has slope v. So it's vx, y equals vx plus a constant. So fk is like, where is it tangent? And hk is like, what is its y-intercept? Um, like, what is the value of this hyperplane at x equals 0? Um, so kind of inspired by this, we're going to define the Steiner point of a convex function, the functional Steiner point. 
And uh, OK, there's some notation here. But like, what, what is the point? The point is just um, my primal definition is averaging like where is a random hyperplane tangent to the, where is a randomly sloped hyperplane tangent to the, the function? And my dual definition is kind of saying, like, let's see how far the function is in each direction based on this legendre fentral dual, which is basically just looking at these hyperplanes. Um, and let's kind of add those up in the same way that we did before. Um, and just because we have this gradient relation, the same uh, Gauss-Green theorem proof shows that they're equal. Um, so instead of the support function, we basically have the, the height of the uh, y-intercept of the tangent plane. And instead of the extreme point, we have the point of tangency of a, of a like, hyperplane. Um, this this, um, this y-intercept function is uh, always finite as long as uh, the input has norm most one. It increases in time, and uh, it's concave. Just like Legendre Fentral duals take convex things to concave things, depending on your sign. OK. So the proof has the same sort of structure. So first, why is it a selector? Um, the reason is that every one of these uh, tangency points for a hyperplane with slope having norm less than one is in the current request set. So we're averaging them, and it's still going to be in the request set. The point is, if I have a point v, which is not in the current request set, then there's some best path that ends up at v, which satisfies the last request. And it satisfied the last request at some point w, which was in the set. And then it's not too hard to see that the gradient of the work function there is just a unit vector in that direction from v to from w to v. So um, one. So you're not going to get any of the you're not going to get any of those points in this weighted average. We're we're taking a weighted average of points where the gradient has norm less than one. So again, we're crucially using like the fact that our requests are convex. Um, why is it competitive? Uh, so I'll show a picture in one dimension, which I think maybe illustrates it better than going through the formulas in d dimensions. Um, the point is we have this convex function in one dimension, and we're just going to look at the um, tangent lines with slope plus or minus one. So for the dual definition, we're looking at um, tangent with slope having norm exactly one. So we only have these two in one dimension. And the functional Steiner point is just the like x coordinate of the place where these two lines intersect. So as we get more requests, this function goes up, and like these tangent lines are moving up. That's kind of what's driving everything. And it's clear that the movement of this functional Steiner point is bounded by the amount that these two lines move up, because the way it's moving is that these lines are moving upward. But also, if the lines have moved up a lot, then their intersection point has moved up a lot. And the cost of opt is at least the height of their intersection point. The reason is that these lines are lower bounds for the convex function. So the convex function is like certainly above the like upper envelope of their two lines. And the minimum of that is where they intersect. So from this, you get that the movement of the functional Steiner point is at most the cost of opt, because you can just express both of them in terms of these lines. So we get one competitiveness in one dimension. Um, in general, we're just going to do the same sort of integral argument. I guess I'm low on time, so I won't go through it. But it's, it's the same sort of thing as before with like the nested case. Um, again, the, the, the dual W star is monotone, so we get the same sort of telescoping, and everything works out. Um, 
Uh, should I should I be wrapping we up? Start a bit late. Uh, you can have another, say, five or ten minutes. Uh, I think that would be about an hour. Okay, cool. Oh, oh yeah, I'll just wrap up, I guess. Um, so, yeah, let me let me say a few things about like other kind of maybe extras. So, you can also express the functional Steiner point in terms of level sets, which is what the um, a GGT concurrent paper did. Uh, so what is a level set of the work function is just the set of points where the work function is at most some constant r. And the claim is that for r large, this is actually the same as the functional Steiner point. The Steiner, is the Steiner point of this convex level set is the same as the functional Steiner point. Um, the, the reason is just, um, what is the support function? It's like the support. It's like the furthest you are in a direction. What is the dual to the work function? It's the furthest your function is in a direction when you like, like um, additively add on the, um, the value of the function. But if you're on a level set, then you can just do everything on the boundary of the level set, and then the value of the function is a constant. So it just kind of cancels out because the integral is symmetric. So, so that, that just shows these are equivalent, actually. Um, the point is, when, when r is big enough, like the, the gradient has norm 1 at every point on the boundary of the level set. And that means that for any uh, slope theta, you can pick the tangent point you use to be on the boundary of the level set. Like There are going to be a lot of different tangent points, because the slope of the work function will eventually have norm one. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the point is just the level set is convex, and you can get this cancellation. Uh, actually, the if you kind of take any level set, not even r large, you're get, you're going to get some selector. So um, what the other paper did was they took a like sequence of r's that increased by powers of 2, and they just use the smallest one that is still valid. And um, that's kind of nice, because you don't actually need any of this uh, like primal dual definition stuff. You can just say you have a nested problem for every fixed r. Um, that's what they did. Right, um, sorry. So, so what I should say, what's, what's going on is you fix r, you look at the level set of places where the work function is less than r. As you increase time by adding more requests, the work function goes up. So for a fixed r, this level set is decreasing. Uh, that's the point. So, so they get a nested problem. Um, you can also chase convex functions directly using this. Uh, so I said at the start, there's this uh, reduction from bodies to functions, but it has this kind of ad hoc thing where you go up dimension. But everything I said works um, just if you directly do it on functions. So you just stay at the functional Steiner point. Um, now you get a d plus one competitive ratio because there's a the service cost is one competitive. Um, so the the primal part of the proof you have to write out a little bit more calculus, but kind of everything works. Um, other norms. You can still define the Steiner and the functional Steiner point. Um, you have to say what the right way to do calculus on a non-Euclidean space is, but it's, it just works out. Um, so you get decompetitive in any norm, or d plus 1 for chasing functions. Uh, this root d log t bound does not hold, because it relies on concentration of measure, and different norm spaces will have different amounts of concentration of measure. So in particular, if we had a lower bound of d for L infinity, and that only used t equals d. So, so this, this, defi this bound definitely depends on what space you're in. OK, um, let me say some open questions. So one obvious one is to refine the bounds even more. So right now, we have a tight bound for nested chasing up to log factors. Uh, for, say, LP, when p is bigger than 2, we have something that's optimal up to a root log t factor. Um, because you can always, uh, you can go from one metric space to another by looking at how much distortion you get if you embed one in the other, and you just lose that factor. Um, and this is in particular nearly optimal uh, if you like are okay with a root log t. 
if you have LP for P less than two, there's, there's a gap in the power of D. So even if T is polynomial in D, there's a, there's a real gap there. Um, I think it would also be really interesting to understand what happens for mildly non-convex problems. Um, like in optimization, people look at quasi-convex functions and sometimes uh, things work out with those. Um, in, in some forthcoming work with Sebastian Bubeck and Yuval Rabani, we looked at uh, K servers chasing convex bodies. So you have K servers and every request is a body or a function and you try to chase competitively. Um, there's no competitive algorithm for that. So somehow when you, when you put these two problems together, it doesn't get any better, even though you might suspect that if you have two online algorithm problems and you just put them together, then you know, maybe you would multiply the competitive ratios or something. Um, more generally, it would, be, it would be great to understand what's going on here. This solution seems like kind of a miracle. Like, is there some way to, that one should be able to tell that this metrical task system problem has a competitive algorithm, but this other one doesn't? Um, that's it. Here are some references. Uh, thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we have some time for questions. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Um, when you said the K servers is non-competitive for chasing, yeah. Is that, do you have like some lower bound on K for which that's true, or is that even true for K equals two? Uh, it's, so, so there's a competitive algorithm if uh, K equals one because that's this problem, right. and there's a competitive algorithm if D equals one. Uh, if either is at least two, it is non-competitive. So, so yeah, somehow the convexity just kind of vanishes. It's kind of surprising. But, uh, Can you explain a little bit more about the one dimensional uh, example where you have uh, those two yeah. tangent lines intersecting each other? Yeah. So when the work function, when the T increases, the work function also increases. So the lines, the tangent lines go up. Why is the movement of algorithm measured in like the vertical axis? You said the uh, movement is also like the point is also going up. Yeah. Uh, right, right, right. So the yeah, so the movement is I mean, yeah, the movement of the Steiner functional Steiner point is definitely horizontal. Um okay. but I mean the like these lines have like slope one and minus one, so like the vertical movement and the horizontal movement are kind of the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Or like, you know, if they're both moving at once, then the horizontal movement is smaller. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Aninda, you want to sort of take us away? Yeah. Well, if, if not, then let's thank the speaker. Let's thank Mark again. And, uh, uh, so the next talk is a week from now. So that's why Shaka a bit. And then there's another gap for a few, few weeks. So we had to change the schedule of the talk because of various reasons. But, and we again apologize for the hiccup. And, uh, but you know, the positive thing is that uh, as the years go by, we keep seeing different events. So uh, uh, yeah, so thank you again for joining us and sorry for the delay.